Good day everyone, Dr. Polaris here. I'd like to start this video off by thanking all of my recent subscribers that have joined my channel over the past few weeks. We've passed the 100 subscriber mark and for that I'm truly honoured. It feels fantastic to find out that there are people out there who enjoy my eccentric ramblings. As promised, next week I'll be starting a new video series focusing on some of the lesser known real animals of our world. Our first rare unusual species will be the large Howe Island stick insect, an interesting example of a modern Lazarus taxon. Now with that introduction out of the way, let's get started with the topic of today's video, Eocene Europe. At long last, the European archipelago broke its relative isolation from the other continents. While tenuous connections to North America had been present throughout the Paleocene, by the early Eocene, a solid land bridge, namely Greenland, served as a conduit for wandering animals. The results of these immigration events are plain to see in Europe's Eocene fossil record. While Paleocene deposits predominantly consist of old endemic groups, such as Rhabdodontid ornithischians, Cagoonid multituberculates, and basal hadrosaurids, Early Eocene sites reveal a wealth of immigrant taxa of North American origin. The speedy rhododromids appear to have displaced the smaller rhabdodontids, while the large chasmosaurine tribe Boreoceratopsinae make their presence felt on European soil. This format was repeated by other animal groups as well. Early Eocene European mammal faunas consist almost entirely of species with recent American ancestry. Squirrel-like tilodontid multituberculates have been discovered in the rich fossil beds of the London Clay Formation, along with several families of metatherian and eutherian mammals. Champsosaurs, alligatorid crocodilians and hesperornithid diving birds are also known to have made this transition. The Messel pit in Germany has produced an almost unprecedented number of incredibly well-preserved Eocene tetrapods. Indeed, only the early Eocene Green River formation sites in North America rival Messel in terms of overall species richness and levels of presentation. Due to the unique environmental conditions present at Messel during the Middle Eocene, a wide swath of smaller animals have been unearthed in almost perfect condition, an extreme rarity in other Paleogene Age ro fossil bearing rocks. Small mammals, birds and squamates form the bulk of tetrapod remains at the site, with larger animals such as non-avian dinosaurs and crocodilians being noticeably scarce in comparison. For the most part, a significant portion of the Eocene metal fauna was comprised of animals with recent North American ancestry. Almost all metal mammals are representatives of North American groups that have completely displaced Europe's older and rather unique mammals from the Cretaceous and Paleocene. Squirrel-like tilodontid multituberculates are a common find, with at least 10 specimens of the genus Eoectipodus having been found so far. Their remains, like most at Messel, are squashed flat and retain a dark furry outline. These fossils suggest that, like squirrels from our Earth, Tilodontids were arboreal herbivores slash omnivores that possessed long bushy tails. Other multituberculates scurried about in the forest undergrowth, occupying niches filled by rodents from our world. The majority were tiny and mouse-like, but the Asian-derived Jatochkatheroid genus Tilobatar was a burrowing herbivore not unlike a hamster or small gopher. However, most other mesal mammals were either insectivorous or carnivorous to at least some degree. Most eutherians here seem to have been either shrew-like or hedgehog-like terrestrial omnivores, with the exception of the chimolestid Groschlagia, a 40 cm long, vaguely dinogaleryx-like predator of small vertebrates. In contrast, almost all metatherians at mesal seem to have been arboreal with long prehensile tails, most were insectivores that incorporated some fruit or plant matter into their diets, but a few were noticeably more derived than unusual. The large Thylaca seaboid, Pitheca lambda, is an important find as it chronicles a shift from earlier forms with smaller body sizes and a largely insectivorous diet, to a more omnivorous niche characterised by large, flat molars adapted for chewing tough vegetation. 
smilotheridium was the largest mammalian predator at Messel, with a body length of 45 centimetres and an overall body shape resembling the genus Dasurus from Our Earth, Australia. Smilotherium was a totally arboreal animal, likely only descending to the ground on very rare occasions. As its name suggests, this animal possessed elongated, sabre-like upper canines for stabbing lizards, small birds, and fellow climbing metatherians in the forest canopy. Squamates are also present at Messel in large numbers and high levels of diversity. Two snakes, both constrictors but only very distantly related, have been unearthed. Germanophis was the smaller of the two, and a member of the ancient Matzoid lineage, measuring 1.5 metres in length. Due to its relatively inflexible jaw, Germanophis was only capable of consuming relatively tiny vertebrates, as opposed to the larger boid snake, Flagellophis. Both of these snakes were arboreal, alongside the gecko, Marginodactylus, the predatory Varanid, Eurosanua, and the insectivorous Iguanian, Masiliguana. Other squamates at Messel were primarily terrestrial. The short-limbed anguid, Dermatoposaurus, rooted about in the undergrowth, burrowing into the soil to unearth worms and other invertebrates. Two genera of polyglyphondontians were present, and, showcasing the diversity of this group, could not have been more different. Rotundosaurus was a large herbivorous lizard with leaf-shaped teeth and a row of dorsal spines, while Lutrosaurus was an active semi-aquatic omnivore. In the case of the former, one presumably adult male specimen found at Messel measured 1.3 metres in length and weighed an estimated 8 kilograms. Indeed, Rotundosaurus was the most massive non-archosaurian animal from the Eocene of Europe a reminder of the hothouse conditions prevalent across the Northern Hemisphere at this time. In our world, Messel is famous for its varied fossil avifauna, and in Alter Earth the situation is rather similar. However, the actual makeup of the avian dinosaur fossil record at both Messels is actually completely different. While a diverse array of fossil birds have been found at Alter Earth at Messel, no representatives of the Neo-Aves clade have been found so far. In fact, most of the avian fossils uncovered here are members of the diverse Enantionothene radiation, an entire group of birds wiped out during the KPG extinction event in our own timeline. On Alter Earth, these opposite birds survived into the Paleogene with their Cretaceous diversity intact. During the Middle Eocene, Enantionothenes occupied a whole host of ecological niches, from soaring carnivores to tiny passerine-like fruit and seed eaters. At Messel, the large raptorial Aurodon was the largest and most dangerous of all birds, with a one meter wingspan and a beakless mouth full of small, sharp teeth. It would almost certainly have caught its tiny insect-eating relatives on the wing, as well as small mammals and reptiles. One potential prey item for Aurodon would have been Flabella penna, a sparrow-sized, insect-eating enantionothene bird known from several spectacularly well-preserved specimens. Thanks to the superlative presentation of Messel's fossils, we know that this small bird had two long, ribbon-like tail feathers likely used for display. Like almost all enantionothenes found at Messel, Flabella penna appears to have been adapted for a life in the trees. Some species, such as the trogon-like Hesanornis, possessed a heterodactyl toe arrangement, ideal for gripping and climbing about in the canopy. In opposition to this, most ornithurine birds at Messel were either terrestrial or aquatic. Massilla diptes was a grebe-like diving bird with lobed toes, Darmastatia was a long-legged wader, and Pseudoturnix was a small, fast-running terrestrial omnivore. Members of groups more familiar to inhabitants of our world, the Neornithines, are rather rare. Two paleonaths have been discovered at Messel. Both were vaguely Tinamu-like in overall proportions, but were substantially better flyers. Paralithornis, the larger of the two, seems to have been capable of both movement on the ground and in the trees, using its long probing beak to catch insects. The smaller Eurotinamus, as its name was suggests, was a terrestrial forager with a diet consisting mostly of seeds, fruit and invertebrates. However, 
One of the most unusual and unexpected bird fossils discovered at Messel was Nanogastornis. This large semi-aquatic anseromorph was a close relative of the enormous flightless Gastornis from, uh, from our old Eocene Europe. Clearly, this demonstrates that ancestral Gastornithids must have been present somewhere in the late Cretaceous world and survived the end Cretaceous extinction event in both timelines. Given the basal position of Gastornithids in the Anseromorph family tree, and the existence of more derived Cretaceous relatives such as Vegavis, the presence of Nanogastornis in Alter Earth makes sense. Unlike its flightless cousin from our world, Nanogastornis was a volant water bird about the size of a small goose, and the heaviest bird yet found at Messel. In fact, Nanogastornis closely resembles a smaller and more heavy set version of the Australian Cape Barren Goose from our world. This is quite likely the form taken by the ancestors of Gastornis from our timeline as well. You will probably have noticed that neo aves are completely absent from any roll call of, of Messel birds. The explanation for this discrepancy is rather simple. There weren't any. During the Eocene, all members of neo aves were combined to South America and Australia, and even then they played second fiddle to the older bird groups that established themselves during the late Cretaceous. In the Northern Hemisphere, avian faunas, like those at Messel, were dominated by Enantiornithines and Basal Ornithurines. Unlike in our own timeline, neo aves never had an earth-shattering extinction event to give them a leg up on their contemporaries, and as a result, their modern diversity is only the palest of imitations of that of our world. I will include here with some interesting final titbits. The remains of pterosaurs and non-avian dinosaurs have been discovered at Messel, but they are very sparse compared to the sheer wealth of small mammal, bird and squamate taxa. Aside from a rhododromid and a velociraptorian dromaeosaur, two interesting arboreal members of Microraptoria scoured the tropical canopy of Eocene Germany. Although derived arboreal Microraptorans have been found in Eocene Asian deposits, these remains were scrappy and gave little indication of the overall body plan of these animals. However, at Messel, both Lemuraptor and Aphchenornis are known from complete skeletons with extensive traces of their integument and soft anatomy preserved intact. These paravians are between 1 and 1.5 metres in length, with long tails, powerful fully feathered forelimbs, and gripping claws suggestive of a predominantly arboreal lifestyle. Unlike their ancient relative Microraptor, these arboreal raptors could not glide and probably scampered up tree trunks and hanging branches using their hooked claws like climbing crampons. Both genera were omnivorous, with fossils revealing seeds and insects in their abdominal cavities. Pterosaurs were also experimenting with unusual evolutionary directions at this time. As darkoids, along with members of Pteranodontia, were the only pterosaurs to survive into the Paleogene. Despite this, only as darkoid pterosaurs have been found at Messel. This suggests that Pteranodontians did not venture too far away from the seas and coastlines, with as darkoids dominating inland forest ecosystems. That being said, the as darkoids found at Messel were rather unusual. Drepanopteryx was a true oddball, having a wingspan of only two meters as a fully grown adult and possessing a number of adaptations for an arboreal lifestyle, including curved claws and short, robust limbs. In fact, the overall body proportions of Drepanopteryx were similar to those of the late Cretaceous European Asdarkid Hatsogopteryx. Both genera have comparatively short, strong necks and blunt beaks, perhaps suggesting a direct relationship between the Cretaceous giant and the Eocene dwarf. All of the pterosaurs found at Messel were rather small animals, with wingspans falling into the 2 to 4 meter range. A similar situation was present at the Green River Formation in North America, lending credence to the theory that as darkoids responded to the spread of tropical forests by shrinking in size and developing novel modes of existence in order to adapt. We know that Drepanopteryx and the contemporary Pseudotapajara were both frugivorous omnivores based on their fossilised gut contents, and traces of a large, fleshy dewlap were found on the neck of the former animal. 
There is certainly no hint of a pterosaur decline in the fossil record of Alter Earth, as prophesized by some paleontologists. On the contrary, pterosaurs and birds simply occupy different niches. Most present and fossil birds on Alter Earth rarely reach wingspans of above 1 to 2 metres, whereas pterosaurs inhabited, and still continue to inhabit, the 3 to 15 metre range. Indeed, pterosaurs have taken to niches that, in our world, were filled by storks, condors, hornbills, and large pelagic seabirds. The two groups share the same environment, but inhabit entirely separate ecological roles. While this examination of Messel's fossil fauna is far from complete, there are hundreds of fish, insect, and amphibian specimens in the addition to the list above. It serves to demonstrate the sheer diversity and wealth of life present in Middle Eocene Europe. The fossil record on the continent certainly quietens down post messel but a couple of late Eocene sites have been tentatively explored in the last several years. But more on that later in part two. Thanks for watching everyone. As mentioned earlier, Next week's video will be the start of a new series where we'll be examining some of the lesser known living species from our world. Again, a big thank you to all my recent subscribers, and I'll see you again soon. Cheerio!